know normally I'm at the back saying, shoo, shoo, come on in, sit down, let's get going. This is the point of the day where I get to say, hasn't it been wonderful? Yes, indeed it has. It's been, once again, just a great conference. I think all of us have enjoyed tremendously hearing all the different viewpoints and ideas, and we all should go out energized, all ready to stimulate more and more participation, I hope. But it's not over quite yet. Let me remind you of a couple of things, since this, that's also part of my role. We have wonderful exhibits that have lots of materials there to be taken home with you so that the conference will live on. And in particular, I am promoting the high school workshop this summer, and we are looking for nominees. And we know that it is very difficult sometimes to find and identify the right party in the high school to whom the nominating form should go or the right student who should get the form and we encourage all of you if you know anybody or you think you might run into anybody please take a nominating form with you as you leave and you have all the permission that you could possibly want to duplicate it by xerox cameras or any other means possible so that the more nominees we get the better because part of our work is stimulating the young people of iowa and that's a very important role for us and has a, been a very good workshop and we want to encourage it to grow and, and prosper beyond that. In addition to that, of course, we have materials that have been left behind by the League of Women Voters and the Iowa Women's Political Caucus and we certainly encourage you to, to partake of those materials as well. Some of them are really interesting in terms of legislative priorities and um, ideas about legislation that's going to be upcoming. So think about looking into that set of materials as well. Lastly, in terms of housekeeping details, do let me mention that after this panel is over and we have a little break, we will be having the political science reception in the Campanile room. And do encourage you to come and just sort of be one-on-one -on -one informally with the various political scientists who are amongst us and with some of the speakers and some of the students and some of the others as well. So that will take place at about 5.30. Well, it is my pleasure in concluding the conference, you know, in some sense they say, did you save the best for last? And I said, of course, we always have everybody is the best. And I think it's been that way at each stage of the, of the day today. But it's my pleasure to be the one to introduce the very last speaker of the day, which is something I did last year. And this is in part because normally you would, you would come up here and you've been hearing all day that we have with us women who broke barriers. And we do have indeed a woman who has broken through many barriers. I mean, after all, who ever heard of women as foreign correspondents? Women as editors? of major papers. I mean, this, you know, a generation ago, this was not the way that normally women behaved. Instead, they were supposed to be asking about pork chop recipes and things like that, remember? But indeed, we have had these kind of women all day today, and in our last speaker, we have that as well. But it's also, for me personally, a great honor to introduce Geneva Overholzer, because I will have to tell you, this is the first time we've met, right? But I've known about her for years. And that's because way back in my dim and distant past, I was in school in a very uh, sexist, gender-biased situation where there were a small clutch of women who banded together because we were the only women in that situation. And we would get together very regularly and commiserate very regularly and drink lots and lots of coffee and wonder how we were ever going to make it through this class or past this particular hurdle that we were jumping and how we all had to be better than the men to get to 
where we were going and all of that. And one of the things I kept hearing was, well, you ought to see my sister. And I heard stories about you way back then, all the way through. And one of my great pleasures was the fact that I was about two steps ahead of Nan, Geneva's sister, as the two of us walked and got our PhDs. And so it gives me great, great pleasure to introduce the Des Moines newspaper editor, the Des Moines Register editor, to you to speak and conclude our conference, Geneva Overholzer. Well, that's truly remarkable. And Ellen just sprang that one on me just now. I do have a pork chop recipe I'd like to give you. But. <laughs> yeah, right, just what we all need, isn't it? Well, here on the Iowa State University campus, we ought to be exchanging pork, pork chop recipes. Actually, what we ought to be doing is out there languishing in the sun, and I am deeply honored to see all of you here when, in fact, any sane person who isn't really dedicated to women in politics would be out there lounging in the sun. It's such a beautiful day. I've been on the campus all day, a kind of a happy uh, conjunction circumstances. Our younger daughter, Nell, is part of the Odyssey of the Mind program, which many of you may know. It's a wonderful academic program that Iowa State is gracious enough to host year after year the regionals for. So she's been here participating in that. And I had a brief moment um, of solitude earlier where I thought I would just look over my notes. And so I went over and sat in front of the Carrie Chapman Cat Center and you know how you, maybe you're looking for these feelings, but boy, did they come over me. And I thought, what a great thing to have this kind of prominent presence in, in such a wonderful location on this really inspiring academic space be dedicated to such a symbol of women's courage and competence. And it really gives me extraordinary hopefulness that that would exist here at ISU. And I know that many of you share that hopefulness. So I really am deeply honored to be part of this experience. My speaking style is odd. I'll tell you right off the bat, I tend to write notes and I sort of go in and out of them. So uh, with your leave, I'm going to do that today. I, I really like my topic, I must say. I've spent 25 years struggling along trying to be a journalist and a feminist and a political junkie all at once, all at the same time. And it's the rare day, indeed, when I get to bring them all together. So imagine my delight to be addressing this subject, gender, politics, and the media. It really feels like my lucky day. I'm also glad that we aren't dealing with titles like the year of the woman or our time has come or something equally optimistic, which would certainly draw out my journalist cynicism quite prominently especially since here in Iowa the proper response to Year of the Woman is, how could we tell? One theory, one theory holds that Iowa is just sufficiently, that we Iowans are sort of sufficiently ornery and independent that we'll do it in our own time. We'll have our own Year of the Woman, but out of cycle with the rest of the nation, which would suit me just fine, and I'd be more than pleased to see it transpire, but I'm withholding my air of expectation. <laughs> more cynicism, I guess. What I want to do today is to talk about women in politics and about the media in politics and about the media and women. But let me start off by saying something that I don't feel at all cynical about, and that is politics and the public interest in it right now. I think it's a wonderful era. I understand that there are, are all sorts of strains of concern about political involvement with politics, and indeed in my own field, there was a veritable rush to leave political reporting just a couple of years ago. And you can always tell when reporters yearn to leave something, it's a sign of their perception, and usually justified perception, that the public is not real interested in it. I mean, journalists are like anyone else. They want to be writing about or dealing with issues that somebody cares about. And it used to be political reporting. I mean, when I went into it, you're exactly right. What women got to do was write pork chop stuff. And what the guys got to do was political reporting. And the editors came not from the food reporting, but from political reporting. Well, lo and behold, a couple of years ago, people were yearning to get out of political reporting beats. This was true at the New York Times. It was true in my own newspaper. And it was a remarkable phenomenon. It was kind of a painful evidence that 
of what a lot of people were saying, which is the public really doesn't care a whole lot about politics. That era is gone, which is a pretty depressing thing if we really are a people who govern ourselves. But in fact, I think that there was a misperception about the meaning of politics. And cer certainly there were people who were very interested in the kind of reporting that a lot of us were doing on politics, a very superficial, often very insider-ish, lingo, jargon-ridden reporting. And I certainly agree that there was some disenchantment with some of the manipulative quality of campaigns, the lack of candor. But real politics, real politics, grassroots level activism is thriving. I think we see that all over the country. We certainly see it in Iowa. We certainly see it in Des Moines where neighborhood groups are more numerous and better attended than at any time since I've been observing the political scene. And many, and many of you will recall that, uh, among other reports, the Kettering Foundation did a report that looked at this, citizens and politics, and it showed the fervor with which people really do seek to be involved. So I think this part of politics is especially healthy and hopeful, and I think it happens to be the same place where women are best represented, close to home. The same is true with people of color best represented at this closer to home level of politics. Moreover, I would argue that the issues that grab people are issues in which women's voices are likelier to be heard, closer to home issues. We did a poll recently as a part of our Iowa poll. It was actually a metro poll and it sampled opinion only in the metropolitan area of Des Moines because the topic was what are you most concerned about in your daily life? In in the city, I mean, what would you change if you, if you had the opportunity to do so? And the issues that came up were these close to home issues, infrastructure issues, but fairly modest ones like potholes and street lights, uh, things for young people to do, quality of life issues, education, the schools, fighting crime at the neighborhood level. These, these are certainly the kinds of issues which engage Americans and where our imaginations are seized by politics. So I would argue that politics remain vibrant, vibrantly meaningful. So what about women's role in that? Again, I feel optimism about the harmony between current yearnings and interests and women's strengths. Think about what women bring to politics. A strong sense of reality, feet planted solidly on the ground, few illusions. These are hard-won traits, I think few glimpses of glory or grandeur, a willingness to work hard. For most of us, any sort of recognition or success really tends to be a, an unexpected delight. Less pomposity, I think, more candor. And I really do think all these traits come to mind when thinking about women. But, and this is a big but, they come to mind only if we really are comfortable being ourselves. And this, of course, gets to the whole arena of how when you're pioneering, you behave like your old comfortable self while you're pioneering. It's a tough challenge. And it gets into some kind of difficult ar arenas. Uh, when I was at the New York Times on the editorial board at the Times, I was the youngest member of the editorial board. Actually, you know, there are various ways in which we all stand out, sex, color, age, whatever. But the one that made me stand out most, I think, at the Times was that I was from Iowa. The New York Times is not peopled by a lot of folks from Iowa. <laughs> the New York intelligentsia finds it somewhat surprising to find among itself somebody from Iowa, <laughs> which made it particularly interesting to me when I came back from New York to get all this mail saying, oh, aren't you that lady editor from New York? <laughs> Can't win. Anyway, while I was at the Times, um, I was part of a, a, a caucus. It was kind of an informal caucus of women and people of color at the Times. And this caucus really needed to exist because there, I've never been part of an institution which is more extraordinarily sort of traditional and gentleman's clubby. And I must say, I say it with great respect for the Times, but it is a truly tradition-bound place. And so those of us who didn't exactly look the part found a lot of uh, sustenance in being with one another. And one time when we were together, a particularly um, put upon woman who happened to be gay and who dressed like a lesbian. I mean, it's pretty clear this woman was a lesbian, not that all lesbians dress alike, but she carried that additional burden, which made people. I think we've got some time for questions. 
Yes. Absolutely. Her point is about Lonnie Guineer. You probably read the New York Times Sunday Magazine piece. I, I am the uh, chair of the convention program of the American Society of Newspaper Editors, and I asked Lonnie, Lonnie Guineer to come speak to us in April on this whole issue, because, um, because precisely because I think that is one of the most egregious examples of this sort of gotcha journalism. I don't know that I agree quite with the worst problem. I don't know that I think the worst problem was that we focused on Clinton's poor handling of it, which actually I think Lonnie Guineer does feel strongly about. I think she, she thinks he really left her out there dangling. But I think the worst of it was what you put your finger on, which is we just, and this is, this is terribly prevalent, even more now today, the herdishness of media. Ne things like Nexus, these wonderful miracles, the, they, the fact that we can pull up information like this and things just get repeated and repeated and repeated. And early on, the decision that it was that she was the quota queen instead of anyone really looking at her writings, it just got picked up. And I plead guilty. Obviously, in a paper like ours, the national coverage comes from wire services. That doesn't mean we can't edit them more intelligently. It doesn't mean we can't try to fill holes in them. It doesn't mean we can make phone calls to the wire services and say, why aren't you reading this stuff? It doesn't mean we can't read this stuff. But it is definitely true that People, people form an opinion early on, and it just, and, and I think she's one of the most dramatic examples of it. Happily, she is also an extremely eloquent spokesperson about it. I went to the National Association of Black Journalists in Houston in July, and she just, you know, she just mesmerized the, the crowd, partly telling black journalists, didn't you, didn't you feel some particular responsibility? Not that they should have to feel any more responsibility than all of us, but, you know, how could you let them eat me alive kind of? And I think there are many different questions in it, and certainly one of them is why Clinton behaved as he did. So I think, but yeah, I do recognize, I recognize it, and I think more people are going to recognize it after 900 people here are talk to the ASME convention in April. But I hope it'll, I hope it'll be a lesson we'll learn. And it's not going to be an easy one, because it is clear that one of the great cardinal sins is kind of seizing on the easy description, the oversimplistic thing. And you know, reading scholarly things, not what a lot of journalists spend a lot of time doing. I bet a lot of people in this room would agree with that, wouldn't you? Yeah. Of course, a lot of it is real dull, if you want to know the truth. But anyway, <laughs> I do think that's terrible. And I'm, I regret it, and I think it's one of the sorrier chapters. But I think it is a chapter that, because of the eloquence of the spokesperson and determination and tenacity of the spokesperson, has a chance really to be well vetted. And maybe we can learn from it. Somebody back there had a I didn't do any mea, mea culpa. I'm perfectly comfortable with having printed it, and I'd be happy to talk to you about it afterwards. So all I want to say is don't attribute a mea culpa to me. Okay, I'll be glad to address that specific, but first let me talk about the general comment, which is an important one. With so many things making life complicated for women and people of color and running for the for public office,